Welcome to Cavalry Conversations. My name is Mariah, and today I have a very special guest with me, and she's also a good friend of mine now. We got connected back in January, so without further ado, it's my honor to welcome Sarah Gonzalez. Woo! Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Mariah. Yeah. I'm so um, I'm so encouraged by how God is using your podcast. And as a young Christian, like as a young adult, it's really a blessing to see other peers mm-hmm. doing their thing for the Lord. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it was cool because back in January, you had emailed me and you were just saying how you like listen to the podcast, which I was so encouraged because I was kind of discouraged in the new year. Um, not knowing if I should continue the podcast and then you emailed me at the perfect time and it was just so cool because we were able to then FaceTime and you shared your testimony and I remember I was asking him like can you share your testimony on the podcast and you're like yeah like I'll pray about it and and so then you were on actually the 700 club it it was released on your birthday but how long ago was was that like a month yeah, about a month ago. A little yeah. more than a month ago. Yeah. So how is that? Was that your first time sharing it on like a big platform like that? Yeah. <laughs> it was my first time sharing it on a <laughs> on a platform that would be broadcast um all over the world. So yeah. that was fascinating. Um and God's timing with all of that. Um and it was so funny because I before I was born again I used to make fun of Pat mm-hmm. Robertson who's like the founder of the 700 club and just the 700 club in general was such a joke in the Mm -hmm. world that I ran with. And so it was just really humorous um, to see God open that door and to be on the other side of things. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Was it a good experience? Did you like it and everything? It was a really good experience. Um, The producer, William Dawson, he was really thorough in, um, in piecing together um, a lot of footage and a lot of different parts of my testimony and um, was just really led by the Lord. And um, it didn't feel like this, I don't know, it didn't feel like this worldly production. um, Just really appreciated their sensitivity to the Lord and desire to do things um, with accuracy to tell the story of what God does. Amen. Amen. And I'll link that below so people can watch that. It's like six minutes or something like that. I watched, but yeah. so good. Yeah. But, all right. So, um, we just want you to share your testimony. That's why we're here today. So, uh, we'll start probably just with your upbringing. So where were you born? Okay, so I was born here in Illinois, and um, my, just to give a little bit of a backstory, because it helps understand my family, um, I'm actually the the first one who was raised um, in Chicago um, on my dad's side. So my dad's side is from Los Angeles, California, and um, still is in Los Angeles, California, and um, and then my mom, her... Um, family was from the general Midwest area, but eventually settled in Illinois. And so, yeah, I grew up here and, um, Chicago is a really, um, intense place. And I grew up with an awareness of what was going on in the city because, um, my father had been a gang member in Los Angeles who, um, came from a family lineage of crime and um, drug use and and imprisonment. And so um, when God saved my father, he went into prison ministry and jail ministry, and he established a ministry here in Chicago in Cook County Jail um, in the 70s. And so I grew up knowing that my father um, had been, uh, you know, to prison and that Jesus had saved him. And um, he would take me, my parents would take me with them to minister. So it was very much a family affair. You know, Um, when he would go to the jail, he would bring me with and into the cell blocks when we would, um, when he would 
be, you know, called to minister on the street somewhere, we would go together. Um, and so I was very aware of, you know, drugs and, and shootings and all of those things as a young child. Um, but I just remember seeing my father's boldness in very tense situations. So I remember one time, um, we were, I think we were by Cook County Jail, and um, these girls, they got their purses stolen, and my dad ran out to address the uh-huh. met young men uh-huh. who were robbing them, and, you know, he, I don't know what he said, he probably said, like, give them their purses back or something, and then they, you know, were like, who, who do you think you are, and he responded, I'm a priest of the most high God. And they mm-hmm. dropped the purses and they ran. Um, and so these types of things were just like normal life for me. Um, and, and so I, I remember just seeing his boldness um, with people who were demonized, with people who were drug addicted, with people who were hurting. And, and um, so that that's just a little glimpse of of my early childhood. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's just cool yeah, that your a- dad was able to be yeah, that bold in those situations because like he could have easily been killed and he knows that and he probably yeah. didn't really care cuz he wanted to be able to you know like the Bible says defend those who can't defend themselves and it's just cool to see, you know, men do that nowadays, especially with our culture yeah. and it, them trying I to know. like take away men's masculinity and all that so it's cool that your dad was tough because my dad he he's italian and your dad you know they kind of have that i love that so it was cool yes yeah i totally when you've uh talked about your dad or even just from hearing him on some of the episodes um i there's a certain type of man that came from that generation (laughs) that is very unique, especially when God gets a hold of someone like that. It's like then all the qualities that could have been used in the world, God redeems to use um, in a really beautiful way. And that that just sticks out to me so strongly with with my father. And I see God's sovereignty in that because I only would end up having him for six yeah. years. Yeah. So tell us about that. What happened and where were you? You were only six years old, which is crazy because that's when my dad's mom, um, in his testimony, where she, when she passed away. So, and that's a very difficult. I mean, it's difficult any time, but especially that young. Yeah. So, um, when, so my mom and I did not know that my father was seriously mm-hmm. ill. Um, I don't really think he had a strong grasp because like a lot of old school traditional men, he didn't love going to the doctor and he didn't, you know, that was a whole different language to him. Um, But he did have um, hepatitis C from using heroin, uh, you know, from his past. And then his, liver and many of his organs were badly damaged by drugs and alcohol, even though when he was born again, he was sober, you know, until the day that the Lord brought him home, he wouldn't even eat, you know, food with wine in it. Um, But we didn't know he was ill. Um, But we were in Bermuda on a on a little family vacation. And I remember um, during dinner going up to him and saying, Daddy, sometimes Mommy plays these songs and they make me miss you. And I remember him embracing me. And my mom tells the story and she's, she says she remembers thinking, why is she saying she misses him when he's right here? And... Um, it was the next morning then when we were getting ready to go to the airport to go back to Chicago and I opened the bathroom door of the hotel room and I could see him vomiting blood. And so um, when we got on the plane back to Chicago, 
I distinctly remember for the first time feeling fear in a way I had never experienced before. And um, it was within two or three days that he, um, you know, he went straight to the hospital and he ended up um, internally bleeding to death because of the uh, cirrhosis of the liver. Mm. Um, And so at that point, you know, it was totally unexpected. Mm. Um, And I just remember my mom, um, my mom and I, I just felt very, very alone because my mother was adopted and didn't have family um, in in Chicago. And then my father's family was in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a strong family support within our local church. Um, And so it was just this very isolating season of, of anguish. There was true anguish. And as a, I was six years old. And so as a six year old, I was watching my mom basically fall apart in her grief. And so, um, the way that I processed that was that, you know, my, my mother lost her husband. And, and so all of my attention was focused on is mom going to be okay? Is she going to survive that? And so that's what eventually would create a lot of um, anger and resentment towards God and a feeling of abandonment, like you've abandoned the widow and the orphan (laughs) Um, is kind of how Satan started to lie um, during that time. And I remember one part in your story where you said you ended up like cursing God with whatever you knew as a young girl when you're at school. What do you remember yeah. that? Well, you remember I, it I obviously, but remember, yeah. I I distinctly remember being in my first like first grade classroom and just you know asking to use the bathroom and walking down the hallway. I remember the bathroom stall and just standing in there cursing God almost as if to say, what, what, what are you going to do? That's worse yeah. than what, what you've already done. Yeah. Exactly. yeah it, I mean, it was obviously really rebellious and, and um, I was in agreement with, you know, lies about the character of God and it, out of his mercy, he didn't, you know, smite me down. Um, but yeah, I remember that. And, and so that being in first grade, um, you know, the, the bitter root really started to be established and only grew over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like that young starting off with just that much hate and anger and bitterness, like you said, a bitter root defiles many and it started doing that to you. And so what was it like, you know, middle elementary school, then middle school, high school? What did it look like for you, you know, without a dad, um, trying to make sure your mom's okay? How did that affect you? You know, it felt like the, it felt like the covering had been ripped off. Like, Whereas I knew a life of stability and, and my dad was so fearless. Like I remember one time my mom woke me up in the middle of the night because she thought someone had broken into the house and my dad wasn't home yet. And she was getting me like getting my shoes on in case we would go outside. And then my dad drives up and she tells him, you know, what's going on. And he just, you know, calmly, walks down to the basement and he's like, anybody here? You know, he, he was just totally (laughs) not afraid. Um, and, and just very secure in the Lord, um, and the Lord's safety. And so there was, I had never known, um, anything but that. And so then when, when he was removed from the equation, then my next source of authority is my mom who was, you know, brokenhearted. I can't even imagine, you know, looking back now what that could have been like for her. But because that, that 
next order of authority being my mom was so broken. It was like, it was like there was no longer any safety. There was no longer a person who was confident and secure and ensuring safety anymore. So um, everything just immediately felt uneasy. It felt like if anything bad were was going to happen, it would happen to us. Um, of course, these are lies that Satan was, you know, whispering. Um, it felt like everyone else has um, God. God blesses other people, mm-hmm. but we are mm-hmm. forsaken. Um, and so, you know, I, as I grew older and I would hear the conversations between my mom and her friends, if she, you know, I, I was very familiar with her voice of grief and suffering. And so that really shaped how I saw life. And so I would say at a really young age, then I, you know, I definitely dealt with depression, definitely um, in terms of, bitterness and resentment towards God, when, when you have that, then you obviously look to seek comfort elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I would say by the time I was 11, like my, I wasn't going to church anymore. And at that point, my mom was so exhausted, um, that she just kind of gave in. Um, and so, I mean, this is the time when like the internet was starting to be a common household thing. And so like, I remember being on chat rooms as a kid, um, just because I was lonely. Um, I remember, you know, being exposed to all types of things on the internet, um, whether it be, you know, violence or pornography. Um, and then by, high school, um, I started to experiment with, with drugs and, um, drinking. Um, you know, when, when you're already, when your back is towards God, like, it's like, it's not hard to find other people who, who, whose backs are against God. And so, you know, those are the, the people then that I gravitated towards, Um, and, you know, looking back on it, I can see now that God had strategically placed godly people along the way. Um, and I think I probably really resisted them. Um, but I also, you know, I'm a, I, 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 work at my church now discipling teen girls and it's given me a sensitivity to really you know seeking the lord's insight about each of these young people and asking god to show me where are they where are they really at yeah. and what 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 do they need um at this time in their life but yeah so i didn't really have that mm-hmm. Um, I jumped youth groups as a kid, you know, I jumped from group to group. I think the first time I smoked weed was at a youth group. Um, a lot of the youth groups were really fluffy, you know, really like pizza and games. And I have no doubt that God may have used it to encounter some kids. But for me, um, I could see from the beginning, like, this is, (laughs) this is just a social thing. This is, this is not, you know, about about the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's good that you're able to see that because you wanted a lot of people when I hear like testimonies, it's like they want the real thing. They want the truth because that's what they're trying to seek. And a lot of people that get into the stuff we're going to talk about now, like witchcraft and different things is because they're trying to find life or something. I mean, it is darkness and death, but they're trying to find something. So they're like, uh, this looks like something's happening over here. So let's go over here. So right. what did that, when was that for you? When did that start? Um, well, you know, just to kind of go back to your point, I, I, I often ask myself, how 
would things look different? And I know, you know, again, God is sovereign, but just as a reflection point, I ask myself, how would things have looked different if I would have been in spaces where there were people who were hearing specifically from the Lord, they were people who were in his word and led by his spirit, Mm -hmm. because now I'm being on the other side of things when when God privileges me to be with my girls and we're doing a worship Mm -hmm. night and, um, you know, as we worship, he's speaking, Mm -hmm. he's speaking, you know, he speaks through me. He gives words through scripture, through words of knowledge. And, and he's so precise. And that I can see, I can see the way that God uses that to grip the hearts of these girls. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to surrender all and, and, and follow him at that point because some still choose to do their own thing. But it's like, it's a moment where God is revealing himself so intimately. And so all of that to say, I had never experienced that in a youth group or like kids ministry church setting. Um, I had experienced it through my father. My father was very prophetic. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't experience that growing up. And so just like you said, this is why so many people gravitate towards witchcraft, towards the supernatural, um, as they would often say, because they're looking for signs of life. They're looking for something that is um, outside of themselves and yet connected to them. And so for me, um, you know, as a child, I had a very strong understanding that witchcraft was evil. I knew as a child that that was something to never mess with. And I had my own share of demonic encounters as a child. And my father would always tell me, uh, because my father had hit many, and it was normal for there to be demonic encounters. He worked in a prison, yeah. you know, and just yeah. being on the streets of Chicago. Um, but he would tell me, if you're ever in danger, say the name of Jesus, you start praying, you start calling on the Lord. And so as a child, I would have dreams where there would be demonic manifestations. And in the dreams, I would say the name of Jesus and the dream would end. Um, And so there was a time in my life where I had the fear of God and I wouldn't touch those things. But as the bitterness and the and as I became disillusioned with God, um, I remember, you know, in my early teens, I wasn't getting into it yet but I do remember some of my friends were messing around with a Ouija board probably when I was like 14 and I knew that that thing was not gonna work Mm -hmm. and I I I, but I knew it was real but it was like the Lord was was confronting me and showing me that he had set me apart and that that thing was not going to work, that that foul thing was not going to work, and that he was going to display that to my friends. And and I remember just having that internal, like, conversation um, with him in the room. And then, you know, sure enough, they they pull it out, and they're trying to communicate with this spirit that they had been speaking to several times. And it wouldn't work. And one of my friends looked at me and she said, it's because you're here. Mm. And so um, there was still fear of God in me at that point, even though I didn't want to follow him. There was still a uh, an understanding that he was more powerful. It was when I um, went to college that I... Um, started to get involved with uh, just a a community in Chicago that did, um, they did Aztec dance, Mm -hmm. they did um, what what they would call like indigenous teachings, um, reclaiming your ancestral roots. And, um, and so as I got involved with that, and my close friend was much more involved in it than I was, Um, I just began to draw from that. And then 
I would have a friend who was into West African uh, witchcraft, but no one called it witchcraft at the time. Um, but, you know, I would then start to take a little bit from them um, and a little bit from, you know, whether it be <laughs> Puerto Rican, you know, witchcraft. I would just take from these different forms of witchcraft and um, I be it started by beginning to build an altar and the altars are often used within witchcraft. Number one, they'll say it's to honor your ancestors who have passed mm. onto the spirit world. But number two, it's also to invoke mm. the spirits of these ancestors. And so, um, you know, in, in Mexican American culture, we celebrate day of the dead. And so I, um, I didn't grow up celebrating that, but I knew that that was, you know, in the culture. And so uh, every every uh, October, I would I started to build the Day of the Dead altar. Um, and so then, you know, when you start to get involved in things like that, just like the scripture says in many different places, when you when you start with a little, it grows and it, yep. it begins to morph into something more involved, bigger, um, and ultimately, we know, leading to death. Um, and so that's how that began. Mm. Wow. And I know that uh, there's a lot of that in Arizona and, like, a lot of, I think there's, like, Hopi Indians and all the different – there's so many things, especially because we're right by um, – and it's by the Four Corners, but then there's also – uh, the White Mountains and different things. And it's just really sad, though, because a lot of people will then take those things and be like, oh, that's cool. And it's just like very yeah. tribal and indigenous and all these things. But they don't know the different things they're welcoming. And it's just it makes me sad because I I know the bitterness and anger that a lot of people have because, you know, the they think the white man and them did them wrong, hurt them. And so they have this bitterness like, okay, we are, you know, hurt, which a lot of things that happen, right, are not right in the past. And we, everyone, we agree with that. But then they're carrying that on till now and trying to like defend and protect. Um, what was that like for you? Because I heard in the 700 Club, we always joke and they tease because my dad has blonde hair, blue eyes, and they call him, they, they joke with him. They're like, blue eyed devil, and say that. But it's not a joke. For a lot of people, that's real. And they're angry. And there's yeah. that bitterness that's formed in that. And so what was that like for you? Because you had a lot of hurt growing up thinking, right, everyone else's life is better. And yeah. so how did that come together with, you know, joining these yeah. things? Yeah, I mean, um, whenever there's hurt, it's so easy to look for a scapegoat and to place blame or have resentment towards who you perceive to have a better life. And so um, I, yeah, and also as a side note, you know, my, my dad's side is Mexican and Hopi. Mm. And so there's that, a lot of my family is like from Arizona for generations. Um, and there's a lot of bitterness and resentment. Um, and it's complicated by the fact that, like you said, there are real unjust things that happen, but the problem and where we as Christians need discernment and to be led by the spirit is how to untangle what, what was, how to entangle the pieces that were truly unjust and done wrong but then there when you throw witchcraft in the mix which these tribes would have been doing it can be really um deceptive mm -hmm. and um and so on one hand you know some some people in the christian faith want to completely deny <laughs> any mm -hmm. type of of wrongdoing which is wrong. And then there's, you know, the other side that takes this really radical stance that everything is wrong with, you know, white mm -hmm. American Christianity. Mm -hmm. 
and ultimately we need the spirit to give us insight. And as someone who wasn't born again (laughs) at that point, I didn't have that wisdom. I didn't have discernment to see what was what. And so, um, my, my anger then was directed towards anyone who I felt, um, had some type of privilege. And so, um, you know, also being in Chicago where, where there's a history of segregation, where there's a history of true police brutality, complicated by the fact that not all police are, you know, like John Burge who tortured, uh, people into confession. But, you know, the, before I was born again, I saw those things in terms of, oh, that's racist or we need to uh, eliminate police. And now being a Christian, I see these things as sin, Mm -hmm. you know, and that each one of us is capable of doing those Mm -hmm. things in our in in our sinfulness. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's no distinction between this group of people and this group of people we are all born in iniquity and and when we see some type of evil done that is unjust you know it's so easy for us to become self righteous yeah. and that's how i was so whenever i would see something you know that i perceived to be unjust whether it was or not there was a self righteousness in me that a pridefulness like a, an arrogance um And that was then married with a hatred towards white people, towards people who had a lot of money, Mm -hmm. towards anyone who I perceived to be ignorant to the sufferings of this world. And as I'm saying that, it's occurring to me that that's a way that Satan, it's like he used my own feelings of feeling abandoned Mm -hmm. And like no one was witness to my suffering and doing anything about it. And I then began to project that onto complete strangers. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Chicago, you know, is a a very active city in the area of activism and organizing. And so um, around the same time I got involved with witchcraft, I started to um, begin organizing around different issues, whether it was, um, you know, at the time I was in a program where there were very few um, black or Latino students. And so, you know, I started organizing and making demands to the college about, you know, why, why is it that our stats look like this? Um, Started getting involved with um, issues around police, around prisons. um, And so, the communities that are often doing this organizing work are extremely hostile towards Christians. Mm -hmm. So just like I said earlier, you know, when your back is faced to the Lord, even if you're seeking something with a zeal for what you believe to be right or true, if your back is to the Lord, then it's already being set up on a faulty foundation. And so I started to become close with a lot of these people and um, become part of, of, you know, what we would, you know, when we talk about Black Lives Matter and different, um, you know, (laughs) Antifa, for example, I knew people who were, you know, um, who identified as that. um, And so, Things started to get really intense then because we're talking about like people's phones getting tapped and um, people going to prison for certain actions. And so, yeah, um, I I never got deep into it in that way because at that time I was a teacher. I was a high school teacher and I'm like, I can't get arrested. I got to teach my students. Um, but, but it was in, you know, my circle. Mm, wow, that's crazy. I know I like see all this stuff and I know I don't experience that because you know where I live is not like that as much in Chicago as it is so when I see these things I'm just like what that it scares me I'm like what is going on just the anger and the bitterness and yeah but what whenever I would think that way even in mine struggling with in as a Christian even self-righteousness like you said Christian or not, like we all need to check ourselves of our pride and thinking like, why are they responding in this way? Like, 
And yeah, yeah. I know people could be like, oh, see, you're so ignorant. You don't know what's going on. But then right. again, right, I go back to thinking, okay, no matter what's going on, they probably do have a lot of deep hurt and things that have happened yeah. to them. And instead of for Christians just looking at that and be like, you just need Jesus and you're going to hell or whoever they think they can fix it. Like you said, only the spirit can bring that to truth. And I love it. Like the woman at the well, what Jesus did, the Samaritan woman, like he prophesied to her and he spoke. Like think of how crazy it would be if someone came to you during that in your anger and said, hey, you're going through a lot of hurt because your dad passed away, right? And Or just some word or something you're going through. Or hey, the night before you thought about killing yourself, you know, just something where they're like, whoa. And my dad had seen that and done a lot of his ministry on the street. And people were like overwhelmed because they're like, how did you know that? And it's like, because God. And it's, and it's wild to me because instead Christians are like, oh, just, you know, just love or they'll use these words like just pray. But it's like, there's power, like you said, that your dad told you, in the name of Jesus, not just to flippantly say, but what he can do if we want him to use us as his vessels. So all that to say, I know I'm talking a lot, but it makes me excited seeing what you're doing now and with the younger generation to not just be like, oh, yeah, yeah, kids, you know, they just go through these things, but they individually have pains and hurts. And we don't just yeah. generalize like they're all bad and they're all just freaking out because of this thing that happened. But when I look at it, I'm like, I really want to pray for specific people God puts in my life that are maybe bitter, or angry towards me. Like this one girl told me, she said, um, I am mad at you because you have, you know, green eyes and lighter hair. And she's like, and your life is obviously just a lot easier and I was like, you know what, that that could be true. You know what, that could be true that my life is easier in certain ways because you think, and she was like, you're so much prettier and all these things. But I was like, but I'm going to have to stand before a holy God who doesn't show any favorites. He shows no partiality and I will be judged based off the life I have and what I've been given. So yes. whatever you do with your life and wherever you started, that's what you're going to be judged by, not comparing it to my life because I have greater responsibility if truly my life was easier. So that's what I said. And she was like, oh, oh," and she didn't know what to say. And I was like, yeah, there's no favorites with God. So that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And, you know, in moments like that, you know, we could be caught off guard or offended. But this is why we have to be led by the spirit and the answer that you gave her was from the spirit that was true and that can cut through the walls of whatever it is um and you know i think about like you were saying earlier when you see you know the footage of i'm assuming riots and things Mm -hmm. happening in chicago or major cities it's really scary it it is because now being on the other end i recognize how demonic Mm -hmm. it is how how like there's 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 a lot of um, a lot of these organizers and a lot of what's going on um, is, is, is demonic. And, um, and a lot of them would um, maybe they wouldn't call it demonic, but a lot of them are proud to be uh, involved with different forms of witchcraft. But at this point in my life, you know, I see things like that and I think, okay, God, how do you want to use your people, not just to go hide in their houses when these things happen, but to flood into the streets? Obviously, you don't go willy nilly doing yeah. things without hearing from the Lord. Yeah. But what would it look like for the Lord to use his people to go and aggressively, not like fleshly aggressively, but, passionately. but boldly yeah. go, for yes, the Lord. passionately go for the Lord and, and, and minister Mm -hmm. to these people who, like you said, they inevitably have deep woundedness. And so this is definitely something that's on my heart and, and it helps give me a a perspective for the young people who I work with now, who, who are maybe at the beginning stages or kind of just crossed the line recently of, of 
being in agreement with bitterness or uh, resentment towards the Lord, it really helps me to like not be put off by that and to see, okay, Lord, show me now how to, um, how to interact, how to engage. Um, the Lord, you know, will give me scriptures or insight. And like you said, it can pierce through and, and grip them where they see that God, number one, he does see them and that he is compassionate towards Mm -hmm. them. Amen. And to say, surely God is in your midst, like not a God, not, oh, maybe a form of God, but the only God, the sovereign Lord. So when was that when you started having your comeback, you know, to Jesus moment? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, I went to New York city with a good friend of mine and we, um, we're staying at this hotel and that night, um, I started to feel like nauseous. And, um, so we didn't go out that night. And so I ended up, um, having what would be my second encounter with a demon because several months prior I had experienced a demon try to possess me. Um, so that was May of 2016. Um, I was in my room with two friends, one of whom was the one I went to New York with um, several months later. And and so in May, you know, the demon tried to possess me and there was a stubbornness in my heart towards the Lord. And yet at the same time, I knew that I was in serious danger. And so I finally started to sing, cover me, Jesus. I just sang those words on loop. And as soon as the name of Jesus came out of my mouth, the demon retreated. So I had had that encounter in May, but when it happened, and even though God gave me relief and protected me. Um, I woke up the next day and I just pretended like it never happened. So, so from that point then on each day I was living with a fear of something like that happening again. And it's so crazy. Like the Bible talks in so many different places from the old to the new about the, the blindedness of men before they are, you know, yeah, born again before they know or... the Lord. having skills on their eyes and, and, and the, the way that man reasons or elevates, you know, their own thoughts above the Lord's. Um, whereas now I see it and I'm like, Oh my goodness, I had an encounter with a demon. <laughs> How did I not, you know, see, okay, it's time to know who is this mm-hmm. living God. Um, but I didn't. And, um, so then in New York city in August of 2016, I had another demonic encounter. And this time my, um, I was up all night and my mother texted me in the morning and she said, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night to earnestly pray for you. There's deliverance in Jesus's name. And she sent me that text expecting me to be like, you're crazy, (laughs) which is usually how I would talk to her when she would say something to me about God. Um, But this time I was shocked and I called her and she told me that she had had a nightmare where I was murdered and that God woke her up and told her to pray John 10, 10 and Mm. Psalm 69 for me. And as I'm piecing this together, I can see that God had woken her up when I was having this demonic Mm. attack and she was interceding for me. And so we got off of the phone and I remember walking out into the hotel lobby and being struck by this revelation that I had rejected Christ so brazenly and for so long. And yet he, out of his pursuit and his power, was continuing 
to draw me, was continuing to pursue me, and that broke the wall of bitterness. And I remember then it was it was as if he lifted the scales from my eyes and I could see that I was a sinner, that Jesus is God, that there is no other God. Because before I was born again, I thought, well, maybe you can like take some from Christianity, take some from Buddhism and make a mix. Um, but in this moment, I knew there that everything else was yeah. false. I knew that I was, I knew at this point that because he revealed himself to me, I was um, responsible for however I would respond. It, and what I mean by that is at this point, I could really see yeah. now. And so to continue to turn from him, that put a fear of God in me and I knew I couldn't yep. but at the same time I also understood and I started thinking everything in my life is going to change because my whole community is going to not accept this and and you know so I had to kind of process am I am I willing to relinquish all that I think I've built all that you know I, I I still had this deception that I had created all of these things, but um, or that they were worth mm -hmm. anything. But I just I knew that I couldn't walk back into that community and be halfway serving yeah. the Lord and still with them. I knew that that would not work. Things became very black and white for me, and that's the grace of the Lord, um, because I wouldn't have, I, that was the way I needed to mm -hmm. see it. And so, um, I knew without even processing it much, I knew the answer already. I knew that all of that needed to be left mm -hmm. behind. I knew that I would never take a drink of alcohol again. I knew that I would never touch, you know, what had become so familiar to me, all the different vices and things, I knew it was all mm. done. And so um, I'm really thankful for that um, because it, again, the black and white just kind of, uh, mm. God was showing me, okay, when you get home to your apartment, you're clearing mm. out all the books, the altars, all of it. It's going, you know, the movies, anything, <laughs> you know, mm. anything. And, um, because now my room belongs to the Lord. You know, now I, he gave me this understanding that everything in my life would now belong mm. to him. And um, yeah, that was August 16th, 2016, mm. which is uh, eight days after my, so my, my father went to be with the Lord uh, August 7th or August 8th. Anyways, the Lord just redeemed mm -hmm. that month because that was the month. Yeah, he passed away and then the Lord wow. saved me. Praise God. That's so exciting. And it's just cool yeah. too to see the radical transformation. Like God was with you the whole way. And you can see that now. And now you're able to do like what your dad did and being able to like do prison ministry and all that. And so can you share a little bit yeah. more? I know we only have a little bit more time, but can you share what you're doing now? Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. Um, so I didn't share this earlier, but when I was a teacher, um, I was working with a group of young men and women who were connected to a gang in Chicago called the Satan's Disciples. Oh. And this was a gang that my father had ministered to. This was a gang that my godfather was from. And so then when I was born again, God just began to open the door to minister to these young men and women in my classroom who would come to me and the Holy Spirit would just provoke them to confess what was in their hearts and what they were doing. And they're looking to me for some type of response. And I was able to share with them about the power of Jesus to take someone who is dead 
and and to transform them, to renew their mind, to um, reconcile them to the Father. And so um, all of this happened very quickly. Um, and um, in 2017 or 2018, um, I ended up moving to my mom's place, and um, and 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 then I I started uh, uh, getting. Um, I started hearing that some of my kids were getting arrested now by the jail where my mom lived by. And so um, I started to go in as a, like as a, as a minister um, to visit with them. And from that, the Lord has used that to connect me to, um, to other people who are in prison ministry and have been, um, doing it for many years. Um, and so at this point now, um, it's just fascinating. I, I just got a hold of some footage of my father and I'll send it to you. Maybe you can put it in the video, but it's crazy because this footage, I never saw it before, but it's my father speaking about me and he's saying how, um, how I am going to stand up one day and give my own testimony and I'll be working in the wow. prisons and, and I'm in the video <laughs> and, and I just got this footage mm -hmm. last week and, and, and I really believe it was the Lord just, um, number one, giving me a gift, mm -hmm. but also reminding me of his word in Ephesians where it says that he has prepared good things in advance for us, that he knew us before we were born. He's called us to be holy and blameless in his sight. And, um, and so you're catching me in an interesting time because it's like in this moment, we're seeing God open the doors to the prisons and the jails in a, in an even more expansive way. Whereas I used to just be seeing my kids, my former students. Now, you know, on Monday, we're going into um, a prison uh, a couple hours away from here. We get to do a prayer conference mm -hmm. there and I'll mm -hmm. be sharing my testimony. Um, and many times there are inmates in the audience who knew my father because he preached to them in the nineties. And, and, and I can just see the conviction on them. Like, yeah, and, because they're still in prison. Um, but yeah, God, God is so, um, I keep using the word precise, but I think we forget how specific he is, you know, in Psalm 139, it says every day of our life, is written in his book. And that's very encouraging for us in, in seasons of um, despair or in seasons of suffering. He has ordained our days and um, he has he has good things in Amen. store for his people. Amen. Well, we're going to have to do another episode because there's so much more I want you to share. I want you to share about the prison ministry. I want you to share about yeah. you discipling these young girls and what that's like and just what it was like then being a new Christian, what that was like from your past and counting yeah. the cost. I think that would be really good yes. for people because they hear the testimony yeah. part, but then they're like, okay, well, now I'm newly saved. I don't do know what I to do. do so, but yes. Well, and, and just before we end, you know, your podcast and then like um, Ryan mm -hmm. Reese's um, radio show that that was actually the first Christian. I don't know, radio show that I ever listened to right when I got saved. And that was so important because I could see there were people who are my age who were talking about real things in the world but they're born again believers and they're talking about it from a biblical yeah. perspective. And so, yes, that is really, really key. And, um, I can't yeah. wait. Well, thank you, Sarah, though, for joining us. And well, I keep saying us, but I'm like, my dad's not here, but the podcast and it's so good <laughs> to be your friend now and have you as a sister in Christ. Well, you are a sister in Christ, but just you praying for my family and my mom has meant a lot. So I really yes. do look up to you and all you're doing so keep it up be encouraged likewise, likewise you guys are such a blessing and i can't wait to come out and yes. visit <laughs> yes that will yes. be the day i can't wait for that and then we'll have to have you in studio and to share more but there we go. maybe soon maybe like a different time we can have you share some more so for people who 
have more questions and stuff because I know we have to end soon. But thank you again, Sarah. And I just love you so much. And I love what God's doing in your life. Amen. Thank you so much. It's such an honor. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. And you can also leave us a five-star review or, I mean, it doesn't have to be five stars, but a review. It's as easy as clicking on five stars or four stars, whatever you like. And you can also follow us to check our behind the scenes on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. And you can also sponsor or support Calvary Conversations by clicking on the link below that says support. And that would be a blessing to us so we can get more guests in person here and for more events. We have Beckett Cook coming on May 15th. That will be at our 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service in a special 6 p.m. Q&A. So make sure you join us as Beckett Cook shares his testimony on how he was in the homosexual lifestyle for 15 years and then he left and came to Jesus. So please make sure to not miss May 15th. Invite your family and friends. And we're so blessed that you guys are listening to Calvary Conversations. If you guys are on any of the other podcasts, um, platforms listening, you can check out our YouTube. But if you're on YouTube, go check out the other um, platforms and make sure to leave reviews because it blesses us so that we can be out there more to reach more people. Thank you so much. We love you guys and we'll see you next week. God bless.